steps that, uh, that you need to take, we, we, we ask that you have the courage to take them and that you would be willing to, to share that with your church family. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to 1 Timothy. Uh, we'll be in chapter 4 this morning. Um, we've been dealing with a lot of different things. I know that we've got some new faces here this morning, so let me just kind of give you a brief background on where we've been going and what we've been doing. Uh, this is a letter to Timothy from Paul. Paul and Timothy were very close to ministry together. They, they, Paul met Timothy when he was about 15 years old. Um, about this time that this letter has been written is about 15 years later, so Timothy is about 30 years old, and he is leading, he is pastoring, probably one of, the most, one of the most successful churches in that time at the church in Ephesus. And so he's dealing with a lot of different backgrounds at this church in Ephesus, the Greeks background, the Jewish background, and all the different cultures that have melded together in that point in time. And so Paul has written this, this letter along with 2 Timothy and with Titus. This is called the pastoral epistles. And he has written these letters as a way to encourage uh, Timothy to make sure that Timothy understands how the church should be run, what should be going on. And if you want just kind of an idea of that, I think we look at it every week, but I want you to remember that this is why, this is kind of the reason why Paul wrote this in, in chapter three and verse 14. He says, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And so we've been looking in the first couple of weeks about all the different things that Paul has, uh, has written here. We, we, we saw that Paul said, look, I, I need to remember my sin because in remembering my sin, it helps me to be a better person. There, you need to be a church of grace. We need to be a church of prayer that prays for our leaders. And it doesn't matter who put them in place, that God has placed, put them in place. And it's our job to pray for them and to get them to, to lead. We, we, we looked at... Uh, uh, Second Tim, uh, First Timothy two on instructions on worship and went through uh, the roles of men and women. Last week we looked at elders and and a little bit of deacons and, and those types of things. But this week we're getting into uh, into chapter four. And so, in order for me to really get you to understand chapter four here, here's where I want to I want to take you. I have over the last couple of weeks, there's two movies that I have watched. One of them I watched yesterday. The other one I watched a few weeks ago, first movie was the movie about Elvis. Has anybody seen this movie in theaters? And you've seen it? Okay. Now look, I'm not going to preach on Elvis this morning. That's not why we're here. But look, it was a fantastic movie. And here's what I, here's one, it was just, it was cut well. I enjoyed watching it. The way that they told the story was from a, a different perspective. If you've not had the opportunity to go and see it, if you were a fan of Elvis at all, I encourage you to go see it. Here's what I knew about Elvis. Elvis died when I was very, very young. And so... Um, I didn't really know Elvis when he, was, when, when, when he was alive. I knew of Elvis because of records that my parents played and the influence that he had on the music industry. Now, here's what we need to know about Elvis. Elvis changed the music industry forever going forward. The way that he uh, presented himself on stage, his enthusiasm, his ability, his, his, this, just this talent level alone, changed the way the music industry went from that point forward. It changed concerts, it changed everything. And he is a, he is, he is a phenomenon that will, never, will always be remembered and he would always did a great job. Now, there was another story I watched yesterday. It was a movie called 42 and it's the uh, Jackie Robinson story. And if you're not familiar with who Jackie Robinson is, he was the first black um, player in Major League Baseball, the, the uh, the Dodgers were the ones that, uh, that put him on. He was number 42. And he was as equally important in his life and what he did and the things that he did and the barriers that he broke in Major League Baseball. And during that period of time, I think it was about 1942 that he came into, into, into play. And so there was still a lot of racism in this country, a lot of you know, blacks only and whites only and the, the segregation that, that, that was taking place in our, in, our, in our country at that point in time. And he broke a barrier that was very important. Now, I say that to say this about both of them. Both of their lives were incredibly important. Both of their lives mattered an incredible amount. But as I watched both of these movies, in each of these movies, there was a, there was a scene or there was a moment in time where somebody or a couple of people who believed in what they were doing, for Elvis and for Jackie Robinson, there was these scenes where people had to remind them of who they were. People had to remind them of their calling, remind them of their talent, remind them of what they were supposed to be doing and what they were doing. And that they couldn't see the history that they were making right then, 
but they were making a difference. Their lives mattered. And so I want, I want to set that up for you to say this. As we get into chapter four here, I kind of feel like that's what Paul is doing with Timothy. It's just this moment where there's, there's this, this person who's speaking into Timothy's life and he's saying, I want you to understand your life matters. Now, he doesn't come out and say it just like that, but I want to read all of it to you. Chapter four is not that long. I'm going to read all of it for you. And then we're going to jump into a few different things that I think are important for us to, to, uh, to see. But let's get into it and, and let me uh, just start right there. It'll be in your Bible. It won't be on the, uh, on the screen, but just listen. Verse one, it says, the spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourselves to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, and for this we labor and strive, that we have put men, and especially of those who believe, oh, I'm sorry, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Preserve in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and the hearers. And so here, I wanna jump into to three different things that I, that I pulled out of that this past week that I think that are important for us to see. And the first one is this is in verses one and two, I think Paul is saying to him here is that God is not the only one searching for people to share a message. You have to be careful. On numerous occasions throughout scripture, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion for someone to, looking for someone to devour. And three times in the Bible, the Bible refers to Satan as the ruler of the world. We see that in John 12, 31, John 14, 30, and John 16, 11. And other passages uh, in the Bible call Satan the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And Paul is saying here that, that some people at, at some point in, in, in time are going to abandon their faith. They're going to abandon what they know. They're going to abandon everything that they have been taught and, and been brought up in, and they're going to abandon that for something else. And it doesn't matter if you have been walking with the Lord and all of a sudden you're just, you're, 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 your attitude is, I want to hear what I want to hear. I want to do what I want to do. I, I want my life to be about me for a little bit. It's amazing how quickly our attitudes can change when the, when the, when the, uh, the selfishness within us begins to take root, right? And so we could, we could be people who have walked with the Lord for a really long time. But if we get caught in the right moment, we can become a vessel for what Satan would have us to preach and to teach instead of what God would have us to preach and to teach. And it says that it, it can become, it becomes such a, a, an issue that false teachers can work their way into the church. People who look respected and should be respected, who have been serving in the church for a while and, and you think they know what they're talking about and all of a sudden they begin to teach things that just don't line up with what, was, with what God's word says. And, and Paul's gonna deal with some of that in just a second. But he says, you've got to be careful that your conscience doesn't become seared. Now, this idea of a conscience is this. Conscience is this idea of the relationship that we know we have with God. It's the idea that of, of we know who God is, that God knows who we are, that we know who we are, 
and how that relationship works together, how that relationship uh, governs my life. And when I begin to understand what my consciousness is, then I begin to understand all the different ways that, that Paul has mentioned or the Bible has mentioned what consciousness is. It's mentioned several different times in Scripture. You'll see in 1 Timothy, it's, there, there's a good conscience that's mis- mentioned. In 1 Timothy 3, 9, there's a clear conscience. 1 Corinthians, there's a weak conscience. In Hebrews, there's a guilty conscience. Um, in Titus, there's a corrupted conscience. And the worst of all the consciences is this one. It's the seared conscience. And the seared conscience basically means this, is that because your conscience has become so numb to who God is, your conscience has become so numb to who God is that you don't really even have an idea of the difference between right and wrong anymore. And this is the worst one that Paul speaks of. And when he says, look, that, uh, that that, that the people have come to a point where they have a seared conscience, what he's saying is they're, they're no longer even teaching somewhat of the truth. And what they're dealing with in this particular passage is this, is that there were, there were men in the church, and we go back to that Gnostic idea that we were talking about earlier, that all matter is evil, right? We talked about that a few weeks ago. This idea that all matter is evil, that God couldn't have possibly created matter because he's too holy. And so all matter is evil. It doesn't matter what you do. And so what these people were teaching in the church right, that, 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 that he is having to deal with is this. He's having to tell, tell them, look, marriage is a good thing. They're telling them not to marry. It's better if you don't marry. But, but Paul's telling them, look, if it's consecrated by God, if God created it, then it's a good thing. The food that they, that they had the, uh, the, the, the religious rules about. It says if you eat this particular kind of food or you eat food from this particular source, then it's a bad thing. You need to abstain from those particular things. And what he's saying, no, 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 is that God has created all of these things. And all of these things are good because he has created them and they need to be welcomed. Uh, and it, what's, what's said in, first, in chapter, uh, verse four, it says, for everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. That's why you pray before meals. You don't pray before meals because you know, your parents did it and their, your grandparents did it. You pray before meals because Paul tells us in, in, in First Timothy here, it says that when we receive things with thanksgiving, it's consecrated by the word of God. And Paul says we got to be real careful that we don't become so seared in our conscience that we lose the idea of who God is, that we lose the idea of what what right and wrong is. And we've got to live in such a way that we, we deal with those. So all of these things have been created by God, and all of them as a result are good. Second thing I want to show you is this. And it's found in, in verses 11 and 12. And it said silence, that we are to silence criticism with conduct. Now, that sounds like really good advice. And it is fantastic advice. It is also the most difficult advice to follow in Scripture. And I'm going to show you why it's one of, one of the most difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's difficult. And when, when you begin to look at everything that he says in verse 11, he says, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for believers in watch speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, when you go over to James, and we won't turn over there right now, but the, 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 the book of James calls, calls this the taming of the tongue where it talks about uh, speech. And James puts it out like this, is that from our mouths, we hear praise and we hear cursing. And you can't be double-tongued. You can't, if you cannot control your tongue, it can set the entire world on fire. It can destroy relationships. It can cost you jobs. It can cost you careers. It can cost you uh, reputations. Our tongue has the ability to change and to destroy not only our lives, but the lives of other people with us. It has, the, it has the ability to make somebody feel small. It has the ability to encourage somebody. But we should never use the tongue as a way to, to bring somebody down. So Paul's advice to us is this, is that we speak in such a way that no one would ever hear two different messages. So when Paul says, look, silence people's criticism with your conduct and start with your speech, if you were to evaluate your own speech, evaluate the, your, the, own, your, your, the, the things that come out of your own mouth, 
how would you, how would you do? Like, are you doing okay? Are you struggling in some instances? Are there some things that you're saying that don't measure up with what you actually believe? Are there some things that you're saying that are hurting, that, that is hurting people, that is, that is cutting people? Uh, are, are there some things that you're saying that you don't really believe, but because everybody else around you kind of believes them, you just kind of want to say it, the same thing as well? You've got to be able to speak in such a way that there's no message coming out of your life. It's great advice. It's harder to do, harder to apply, right? He also goes on to say we've got to, we've got to, show, uh, we've got to show love to people. And the way that we conduct ourselves, we've got to show love to people. And the idea here is this, it's that agape love. It's that love that says that no matter what people do or say about me, I am going to seek nothing but their highest possible good. Now think about that for a second. No matter what people say or do to me or about me, I am going to seek their highest possible good in every circumstance. Now think about the people who have wronged you. Think about the people who have wronged your family. And I'm not even talking about the things that you kind of think they might have. You know they did. You know they have wronged your family. Is this a way that you feel about them? Again, incredibly practical advice. Be able to use your conduct to silence people's criticism in the way that you speak and the way that you love people. But it's hard to love people that way, isn't it? Because we, get, we, wanna, we wanna take revenge. We wanna, we wanna stand up for ourselves. We wanna make sure that people know who we are and, and what we're all about. We wanna make sure that, that people understand you can't just do somebody like that. But what the Bible says in the way that we treat people is that it should be no matter what you've done to me, Regardless of how you've treated me, regardless of how you've treated my family, regardless of what situation you have put me in, I am going to love you not because of what you did, but because of who created you. I'm going to love you and seek your highest possible good regardless of how you've treated me. And I'm going to make sure that I do everything I can to show you the love of God and not my love. Because sometimes our love not all that good, right? And we have to lean into God. We have to lean in on, on who he is and his character so that we know how to love people better. He then goes on to say that in our faith that we should, we should silence criticism. And, and one of the ways that we do that when we understand faith is our loyalty to Christ regardless of the circumstances. Regardless of the circumstances. There are moments when it's, it's easy to be faithful to God. Because everything's going our way. I mean, who hadn't had things going their way every once in a while and you're just, you're just happy? You think, man, God is blessing me something wonderful right now. I mean, I just can't seem to miss. Like the money is coming in, the house is coming in, the kids are coming in, everything's coming up roses, everything's wonderful. And it's so easy to turn around and thank God and say, God, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for just blessing my life the way that you've blessed me. And then we, we, we get a little bit to the arrogant side, and we think, man, I must really be doing something good for God right now. You know, I must, I must be hitting all the church services. I must be singing all the right notes in the songs. I must be hitting all the right quiet, quiet times. I'm, I'm doing all the right stuff. And we get a little puffy, we get a little arrogant. And what happens is a, a different circumstance comes along. And everything that was coming up roses for us earlier is now not, right? And we can't seem to have enough money and we can't seem to take care of things and, and our kids are making poor decisions. I'm making poor decisions. I'm not spending any time with the Lord. I don't really get into worship services anymore because my phone is ringing or buzzing in my pocket and I've got to check to see what's going on. I'm not connected with God at all. And all of a sudden there comes a sense of hopelessness in our life. A sense of hopelessness. Now as Christians, we know that we're always, we always have hope. But because we, we're going through some stuff we have this sense of hopelessness in our life. Let me ask you a question. When you're going through those moments in your life, is it as easy to stay loyal and faithful to God? Is it as easy for you to turn around and say, God, thank you so much for what I'm going through right now? It's not. It's practical advice. It's great advice, but it's hard to live by. But the Bible says that, well, look, we've we got we to be faithful regardless of the circumstances. Because our joy is not found in circumstances. Our joy is found in Christ alone. 
And only in him will we have the ability to always be faithful and to always thank God for all the things that we're going through. And that's a hard place to get to. One of the other things that he says, says here is that the purity is this, this idea of purity is that is an allegiance to the standards of Christ. And let me just say this as Christians, people who are walking with God, we should have a higher level of standard than the world around us. Period. It shouldn't look the same. It shouldn't intertwine a little bit. Our standards for what God expects and what we expect of ourselves because we're in a relationship with God should be higher than the world around us. Does that make sense? The, 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 the expectation of honesty in our life. The idea that we would just give a little white lie here because it's just going to make somebody happy. Look, honesty is honesty. And we've got to be honest in every single thing that we do. The, the, the opportunity to, to, uh, to post-date something because it's going to be a benefit to you later on. That's just not being honest right? The idea of saying something that happened that didn't really happen. It's just not being honest. We want to, we want to have a different level of, 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 of morality and standards for our life where honesty is concerned. Same thing as where, um, where self-control is concerned. When we have the, this idea that we're going to be self-controlled in the things that we eat and the things that we do and the things that we say and the way that we, we look at different people, this idea of self-control has got to be higher, a higher standard than the world around us, along with the discipline that we have in our lives. Look, it's not easy. If anybody ever told you that walking with, with Christ was an, was an easy deal, they lied to you. To, to walk with Christ means that we, we have to rise up to a different level, to different expectations, to be different in every single way possible. These basic standards should be far and away above the basic standards of the world that we live in. And so again, silence criticism with conduct, great, great advice. However, it is difficult to follow. But those who are disciplined and those who are walking with God and those who are living their life in such a way that he is honored and he is praised, it's doable. It's not, a, it's not an undoable thing. And the third one I want to get to is this, is that you're to know what you believe and why and then live it out. Look in verses 15 and 16. It says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch this part. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, here's the idea here. Paul tells Timothy that he's, not to give him, that he's to give himself wholly to the matters of Scripture, reading, teaching. He is writing specifically to Timothy. I want to make sure that we keep this in context. Paul is writing specifically to Timothy. These are instructions to Timothy on how to run his church. Again, huge church, very successful church. Timothy has done great work. Paul spent three years helping set up this church. When you go back and you begin to read about the amount of time that, that, that scholars believe that, he, that Paul spent in the three years in this church, preaching to them and teaching to them, the amount of, of time that they received in, in being educated in God's word would have gotten every single one of them a seminary degree. They spent tons and tons of time being, being, being led and being set up to, uh, to be successful. And then Paul puts Timothy in charge and says, look, I've got to go be a missionary. That's what I've been called to do. And so Timothy is continuing to do what, 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 what Paul had set up. And he is leading these people. And as he's leading these people, he's leading this church that people are coming in and they're being saved. But there's also people rising up within them that are teaching false doctrine. They're teaching things that they ought not to, to, uh, to be teaching. And Paul says to Timothy, look, as you continue to lead this church, you take care of your scripture reading, take care of your teaching, and do not neglect your gift. When you begin to do those things, when you spend time in God's word, Timothy, listen to me, you're going to get stronger in your faith. When you spend time in God's word, you're going to be able to answer harder questions about your faith. When you spend time in God's word and you are teaching God's word, people are going to understand who God is better. You're going to understand what it means. Look, if, if, how many of y'all, just out of curiosity, have ever been teachers? 
Just raise your hand. You know that reading information and teaching information is a whole different, a whole different deal, right? It's easy to read and gather information. It's a whole different thing to be able to stand and teach that information to somebody else to the point to where they'll grasp, they'll grasp it. He's calling, on, he's calling on Timothy. He said, look, not only do I want you to learn it, but I need you to learn it in such a way that you can make it easy for people to learn themselves. You need to be able to teach it. And in doing so, you'll be blessed. And what's going to happen is you'll be able to grow ever more able to lead your church in a very positive way. Now, What that means is this. He says, watch your your life and your doctrine closely and preserve in them. And watch this. Here's the benefit. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is what he's saying to Timothy. In your ministry, pay close attention to what you do. Pay close attention to your reputation. Pay close attention to the words that you're speaking. Pay close attention to the way that you're acting. Pay pay close attention to the way that you treat people. Pay close attention to all of these things and make sure you keep your doctrine sound, your theology sound, and build it on the entire word of God, Not not just pieces, not a verse here or a verse there, but the entire word of God. Build build your theology on all of that. And the benefit to you will be not only your salvation, but the salvation of those who have the opportunity to be a part of your ministry. Now, it's important that you understand that Paul is talking directly to Timothy. But understand this morning, I'm going to ask this question directly from me to you. How's your ministry doing? Are you watching your doctrine closely? Are you watching the way that you treat people? Do you love people? Are you considerate? Are you empathetic to them? Do you speak words of encouragement to them? Do you share with them who Jesus is? Or do you leave church on a Sunday morning, you go to your house and you eat, close your doors and never speak of him again? What does your ministry look like? What does your ministry look like in your home? What does your ministry look like at your workplace, at your school, students? What's your ministry look like? What about with your friends? Are you telling them about Jesus? Are you showing them who Jesus is? What about in the talent that you've been given? If you have a talent to teach, are you using it? If you have a talent to sing, are you using it? If you have a talent to play sports, are you using it? What, are, what, what gifting do you have and are you using it to the benefit of the gospel? What about in your illness? You say, all those are good things. Well, your illness is not necessarily a good thing. What if you're struggling? What if you're struggling physically? What if you're struggling and and the doctor has told you, hey, look, there's no hope for you. You've got so many months to live. How are you using your illness for the gospel in your ministry? What about with your spouse? Do Do you love your spouse in such a way that people would look at your marriage and say, there's a man of God or there's a woman of God? because of the way they treat each other, because of the way they talk to each other, because of the way they respect each other, because of the way they only have eyes for one another, their faithfulness to one another. How is your ministry doing? Are you watching your life and your doctrine closely? Do you know who he is? Listen, I've said this before and I'll say it again. God's called each one of you to a next step. You, I don't know what that next step is for you. For some of you, you need to come into a relationship with the Lord. You need to give everything that you know of who you are to everything that you know who Christ is and commit your life over to him and say, you know what? I don't understand everything, but I understand enough to know that I have looked everywhere else and I have not found peace anywhere except for in the words of God. Some of you need to give your life to Christ. Some of you need, like Darla this morning, need to be baptized. You've not taken that step. Or you took that step out of order. The Bible tells us that we're to, when we come into a relationship on our own with Christ, then and only then are we to be baptized as a, as a, as a, as a, as a public confession of our relationship with the Lord. Maybe he's calling you to serve in a different way. Maybe you've, you've, you've kind of 
been coming to church and you've been a part of a few things, but God's calling you to do something different. He's giving you resources. He's giving you abilities that you need to plug into this church. And you've got a next step to take. I don't know what that looks like because I don't know what God's telling you, but I know this. He's not called anybody to just sit there and stay right where you are. He's called all of us to continue to get better, to continue to grow, to continue to look more like him every single day. Guys, my prayer is this, as your pastor, is that you would know God better today than you did yesterday, and that you'll know God better tomorrow than you did today, that you're feeding yourself spiritually, that you're walking with him, that you're doing everything that you can to share the gospel, because this is our opportunity in here on a Sunday morning to re-energize and get excited about what God's doing in our life, and then to leave here and to go do something with the gospel. How's your ministry doing this morning? It's a great question. If you've got a decision that you need to make this morning, I'm going to be down here at the front as we finish up. My prayer is that you would be the first person to step out. And somebody asked me last week, they said, JJ, look, you keep always talking about people coming down to the front. And he said, I gave my life to Christ a long time ago, but I don't know that I ever came to the front. He goes, am I not a Christian because I never came to the front? Absolutely not. The Bible tells us that when we believe and we confess that we're saved. It doesn't take a special prayer. It doesn't take coming to the front. This is just another avenue. There's one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. But there are a lot of different ways to get to Christ. There's a lot of different ways to come to him. Coming to the front and doing a public confession. Sitting right where you are and praying sitting down knee to knee with a, with a parent or with a friend and, and saying, this is, what, this is what God's telling me to do. God, it doesn't take me to be a part of your decision. What it takes is you being honest from your heart to God's heart that you want to be a part of his eternal kingdom. And so this morning, this is just an opportunity. If you want to take the opportunity to come down here, place your life in this church, I'd love to visit with you. If you want to come down here this morning and, and, and place your life in the hands of God through Jesus Christ, I want to have that conversation with you. And I promise you I will stay down here until I visit with every single person that needs to be visited with. And we will all celebrate this morning as we walk out of here. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.